Jesus. Praise your name, God. Hallelujah. Bless your name, God. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. God Almighty. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, God. Hallelujah. Lion of the tribe of Judah. God, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, hallelujah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Lord God. Bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. Good evening, good evening, Deshonda. Pastor Denise and my friend Cornell, God bless you. Thank you for joining this evening. Hallelujah. We're going to get started. Where there's two or three gathered in the name of the Lord, he promises to be in the midst. And truly the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. The word says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. And I don't know about you, but I trust in the Lord every day because he has a sustaining grace to keep us in his will and his plan, his purpose for our lives from danger seen and unseen. <clears throat> and many times the enemy has assignments to come against you, to destroy your life. But because of the presence of the Lord in our midst and he surrounds us, <clears throat> he keeps us secure in his presence every day. And it's so awesome to know that we serve a mighty, mighty, mighty God. Hallelujah. Tonight we're going to talk about, in the book, The Bait of Satan, living free from deadly traps of offense. An offense of rejection. An offense of rejection is what we're going to talk about tonight. <clears throat> but let's open up a word of prayer. And then we're going to get into our, our lesson tonight. It's a really good lesson. It's very informative. And it's very encouraging. Hey, God bless you. Amen. So, Father, this evening we come before your awesome presence. God, asking you to move the busyness from the day from our minds, oh God. That we have clear conscience to hear from you, Lord God. That we focus on your word. That you will speak to our hearts, oh God, by divine unction of the Holy Spirit. To bring changes in our lives, cleanse us from our sins and iniquities, O oh God, anything in our, in our hearts that should not be, God, tonight that we are aware of, we ask that you take it out, God, that you purge us in the blood of the Lamb and saturate us in your anointing, that we have, a Father God, a clean heart in your presence, in Jesus' name. You said, without holiness, no man can see the Lord. Lord, make us holy every day as we learn how to yield, surrender, and release ourselves in the will of God, that you will be glorified. And I thank you, God, for every person that comes on tonight, God, that something will be spoken that will help encourage them in their faith to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are, even through the pruning process, God, that you have to take away things in our lives sometimes to make us better. We ask that you have your way in us, O oh God, and we'll be grateful to give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So tonight we're going to talk about an offense called rejection. And many of us, sometimes in our lifetime, has experienced some form of rejection. It may have been from a brother or a sister. It may have been from a cousin or a close friend. But the worst rejection many people experience <clears throat> is rejection from the father rejection from the father because we look up to our fathers we look at our fathers as a person who's a protector and a provider for us as children and many times 
when the father lets you down, you have an event in school. I remember in elementary school, you want your father to come to maybe a basketball game that you might have been playing on the team or a football game or a soccer game or whatever event, uh, singing in the school choir. And you wanted your father there because it made you feel good to know that the strength of the family was supporting you. And that's the father because the father is the one who carries the strength of the family. And when the head is not right, the body would not be right. And so as we think about rejection, rejection is a form of someone letting you down. They turn away from you and it hurts you. And one thing about the enemy, he does everything in his power to dismiss us, to refuse us from anything that would make us better in our lives. So he allowed people to come to your life to be an offense to rejecting you, even in conversation. You may be engaging in conversation with someone and they reject you because they don't want to hear from you. Or you're on your job, you feel rejected, you feel isolated, feel alone. So there are many different ways in our lives we can experience rejection. But one thing about rejection, when you think about the person who experienced the worst rejection, for us all was Jesus Christ. He said, my father, my father, why have thou hast forsaken me? When you go to Matthew chapter 27, and at four, verse 45 and 46, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 and 46, and it says, at noon, Darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice. And this is in the New Living Translation. Eli, Eli, Lemabathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And Jesus experienced the worst rejection we all could ever experience because he was the son of God. Not only that, if you really study the scriptures, you'll find out that even when Jesus was dying on the cross, God himself would be put to, put to death on the cross because Jesus was still part of the Father, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're still the Trinity, the triune, triune God. So one part of the Godhead was being put to death was still with God being put to death on the cross. But the father rejected Jesus because he had taken upon himself the sin of the whole world. And he was rejected because God being a holy God could not look upon sin. And so God had to turn his back for a moment on his own son, his own his own uh, nature, his own character because of the sin of the world. It is one thing to experience rejection and malice from a brother or sister. My God, my God, my God. Okay. So it's one thing to experience rejection from experience rejection and malice from a brother or sister, but it's entirely different to experience rejection and malice from a father. And that word malice is, is a desire to do harm to somebody else. So you feel like your father's rejected you, that's doing harm to your emotions, harm to your feelings, make you feel that no one cares about you. You have a mother, you have a father, and those who didn't grow up with their fathers, they, they feel the effect as they begin to grow up without the absence of a father in their lives, that where was my dad when I needed him? Where was my dad when I was going through trouble in school, when bullies were messing with me, when this or that was happening to me? Where was my dad? You know, that's one thing I can say, even as a, a teenager, I experienced rejection when I was, when I was uh, mistreated by somebody else, abused by somebody else. And I wanted to talk to my father, but because of the type of demeanor he always had in our lives, we were afraid to talk to him about different things that would take place in our lives. And I thank God for God being my father, because even at that time of being rejected, 
My father didn't know how to deal with the rege with the things I was experiencing in my life, the molestation and, and, and abuse and all this stuff I had to encounter at the age of 14. He didn't know how to deal with it. So instead of him talking to me, he rejected me. And the thing is, as I got older, I had so much anger and so much malice in my heart. I wanted him to die. I wanted to kill him because I felt like you're the one that I'm supposed to be taking care of me. And you're the one I should be able to talk to when things are not going right in my life. I have my mother. Sure enough, I was close to my mother, but I wanted my father to, to love me too. And it felt like I was not being loved by my father. So as I began to grow up, I grew up with all this malice and, and bitterness in my heart. Started drinking at 15 years old and kept on living a riotous life all the way through, through high school, even through my young adult and adult life, living a wild, rambunctious, sinful life. I was doing whatever my mind told me to do. I just did it. Knowing it was not glorifying God, the life I was living or the behavior and the things I was doing, yet I thank God. Because when God calls you as a child of God, he does not reject you. Even though we feel the rejection of a human being in our lives, God never turns his back on us as his children. But he will punish you. He will chasten you because he loves you to make you better. That's why I love the script in Matthew 15 chapter where he talks about the pruning process because God loves us enough to where he has to cut people off in our lives, cut things off in our life that's drawn our attention away from him. He has to allow things to happen in our life to make us better. And many times we reject it, we fight against it, we get stubborn, we get hardened hearted, and yet God said, all I want to do is make you better. But because of the sin nature, I build up this wall of protection. We talked about this in previous lessons, how I build a wall of protection to guard myself from being hurt. But all the time, I'm locking God out from coming into my life. I am a multi-grade junior high school and high school teacher. I recently read the, the uh, debate of Satan, which brought several revelations to my life. I shared the video with my students and the Holy Ghost was, was str so strong in our classroom that everyone began to confess offenses even, and, and ask for forgiveness. That is so awesome. Several children said that was the best they had all year. One student reconciled with, his, with her father after a huge falling out. Another started healing process from deep wounds with her grandmother. And that's a key point. Rejection will cause wounds. Rejection will cause you to have a deep scar in your heart to where when God wants to heal you, because I've been hurt so much, I find myself gravitating in relationships to people who do the same thing to reject me and afflict me. That's what we talked about in previous lesson, how like-minded spirits will connect with each other because they're familiar spirits. Satan does not bring anything into your life that you're not familiar with. So when you get into relationships and the relationship is not going the way you want it to go because you feel rejected. So you're still holding on to the wounds and the scars of the past when this person trying to come and love you and make you better. So instead of letting, letting them heal me to help me come, become the God, what, what God wants me to be, I got such pain and anger and hurt in my heart, I reject them. So we reject the people God sent into our lives that are there to enhance our spiritual growth. Your pastor, your ministers, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, the five-fold gifts God placed in the body of Christ are there to enhance the body of Christ to grow from rejection. So just because I've been rejected as a child in my adult life or my young adult life or teenage years, God says, I set things in order in the body of Christ to bring forth healing. Because until you're healed, you never operate in the full calling God has upon your life. That's a key point. You never find yourself fulfilling the calling on your life until you allow God to come into your heart to heal your brokenness. <coughs> If God doesn't heal the brokenness, the brokenness will keep you in abandonment. It'll keep you isolated. It'll keep you in, in the wilderness. 
It keep you separated from other people where you have to lock yourself up in your house by yourself. Don't want to talk to nobody. Don't want to be around people. Don't want to go nowhere. You only go where you need to go and that's it and come back home and lock yourself in the house. So now I become a prisoner in my own house because I've been rejected. You can go to the store and you can try to ask customer service to help you and they reject you. So now I'm mad because I've been rejected in the store. So that same spirit of rejection gets on me. I go do it to somebody else because I was rejected. Now I'm rejecting other people. And that's what God wants to know tonight. That's healing from rejection. When you allow the spirit of God to come into your heart to heal you and bind your brokenness and set you free. The Lord really ministered to these children in a mighty way. Thank you for this message. My father, Noah see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hands. I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. <coughs> this is Samuel. This is verse Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. First Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. Let me go there right quick because this, this is uh, really a good scripture. And this is when um, the encounter about David and King Saul, how Saul was jealous of David because God called David to be the next king. And anointing was placed on David's life and Saul was angry about it. So Saul wanted to kill David. So in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, I mean, chapter 24, chapter 24, uh, verse 11, chapter 24, verse 11. In the New Living Translation, it says, Look, my father, and what I have in my hand is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proved that I'm not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been haunting for me to kill me. And that's what Saul was doing. Because of his jealousy, envy filled his heart. Rejection filled his heart against David to where he sought to kill David. How many times have you done everything God told you to do, but yet it seemed like everywhere you turned, people were against you? And this is how David felt. He felt rejected by someone he loved and someone he cared about. And because the very person, he looked up to Saul as a father. And now Saul has rejected him because he allowed evil to fill his heart. Even the same David who played the heart to calm the evil spirit in Saul's heart when he was getting into rage. This is the same David who killed Goliath when the Philistine came against the children of Israel. This David is the one God appointed to be the next king. And because of the anointing upon his life, it caused him to get into a position of rejection by the people he loved. In the last chapter, we saw how Joseph's brother sought to destroy him. We saw the pain he experienced from this betrayal. Perhaps you're in a similar situation. You've been betrayed by those closest to you, people from whom you wanted to love and encouragement. So people that you wanted to love and encourage you now they're against you and you haven't done anything wrong for them to treat you this way. And that's how I felt many times when I've been around people and I was rejected. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything wrong to them. Why are they rejecting me? Why are they they're stepping over me? Why are they treating me so bad? But yet God has through the years begun to heal the brokenness of my heart. And bind my wounds, strengthen me in the inner man, and call out the righteous lion inside of me to stand up against rejection. And that's what you have to do as a child of God. You got to get in your word. You got to meditate on that word. You got to mutter that word. I mean, speak that word, memorize that word, keep, keep declaring that word over yourself, over your family, over your household, over your possessions. Declare the word of God. Because Anything the enemy has brought to destroy your life, God has a remedy. It's called the Word of God. 
And that word that he spoke is spirit and it's life and it's protection and provisions. So everything I need is found in the word of God. And all I got to do is just rest in the finished work of the cross. Rest in the victory that's already been won. Allow Christ to defeat the adversary for me. And I just receive it by faith. In this chapter, I want to deal with a situation more painful than betrayal by a brother. It is one thing to experience rejection and malice from a brother, but it's entirely different to experience rejection and malice from a father. When I speak of fathers, I'm not just referring to the biological father, but to any leader God puts over us. And that is so good because God has people in position, spiritual fathers, to lead you, to nurture you, to care for you, to govern your life, to help you get to the place God has for you to arrive in your life or to achieve in your life. These are people we thought would love, train, nurture, and care for us. These are people that we thought who were there for us. In the time I needed a counselor, in the time I need someone to help me, in the time I need somebody to be a friend to me, these are the people who let you down. And God is saying tonight that we have to get to the place in ourselves to allow the Spirit of God to minister to our hearts, to bring us to the light of truth and know with confidence that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So if he's the greater one inside of me. It doesn't matter what the world says or what they do. God is for me and not against me. One second, please. Someone trying to reach me. One second. Hallelujah. I hope this is helping somebody tonight because this, this is good. This is good because we got to get to the place in ourselves where we recognize these spirits when they present themselves to us because that's what the enemy wants to do is bring you to a place of fear, doubt, and unbelief to destroy your life. And you got to recognize the spirit of Christ when he comes to you because the enemy, he knows who to surround you with that's for your, for your demise. To destroy you, to make you feel inadequate, to make you feel worthless, to beat you down emotionally. And we have to be aware because the spirit is like a magnet. If I have pain in my heart, it's going to attract me to other people who have pain in their hearts. If I have a messy life, it's going to attract me to people who are messy. Because I'm not allowing myself to focus on God who has the ability and the power to set me free. So I allow myself to get into a vulnerable state of mind where I attract the same like-minded people and they all, all come together in one accord and we talk about the gloom and doom of our lives. As the world turns, it's the same old cycle. As year go by, year by year by year, it's the same old situation. I, 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 I remember something. And I was praying about this uh, one day. I said, God, how come it seems like every year in a certain season, a certain month, I find myself getting weak in the spirit? Why is the same temptation that defeated me in the past Rise up again to bring me to the feet again. You know what God said? Because you allow yourself to be distracted from your focus on my word. And that's what happens. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell this for somebody. Anytime you find yourself falling in the same old entrapment of the enemy, you have to recognize this is not of God. This is of the devil. And then you have to recognize that I can't fix this myself. I can't be a lone ranger in the kingdom of God. I can't go on my own journey by myself. Because the Bible says though there be many, many members, yet there's one body. We are all part of God's body. And therefore, check this out. We need each other. 
I need you, you need me. I need you to survive. I need you, you need me. I need you to survive you, because we need each other to survive in the kingdom of God. But we have to have a humble spirit to receive the help that God sends us. And that's a very important thing to pay attention to. When God sends somebody in your life, check this out. You might be going through financial difficult. And it's like every check you get, it's like a you put it in a pocket with holes in it. And you wonder why God is like, I make so much money, but yet I'm always end up empty. One thing about God, he told one of the prophets, I think it's in the book of Amos. He told prophet Amos, he said, tell the people to consider their ways. He said, because you're living in your dainty houses and my house is empty. You're not concerned about my house. He said, so every time you gain money, I blew on it. So you end up coming with little, like putting in pocket with holes. So we have to pay attention. When God told Malachi to write to tell the people to give 10% of all their increase to the Lord, the tithes and the offering, he said, I will, he said then I'll open the window of heaven and pour, pour out blessings that you don't have enough room to receive. Because he knew the principle of the law of giving it, sowing and reaping. So if I sow, I'll reap. And one thing about it, I found it to be a very true, true principle. When every time I sow from everything I get in the kingdom of God, God always allow it to come back to me double. Every single time. And that's because I'm not given a necessity. I'm not giving because I don't have enough. I'm not giving because I have enough. I'm giving in obedience to what God has instructed us to do as his children. To give unto the Lord. And he will bring it back to you. Good men just pressed down, shaking together, running over. Shall men give it to your bosom. And God does just that. He'll touch people's lives to give back to you because you gave to him. But we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're not going to go there because that, that's a whole other lesson by itself. So we got to pay attention that there are people that God's in a position to love us, to nurture us, to train us, and to care for us. Just like the shepherd with his sheep. He's there to make sure the sheep are okay. Make sure they're taken care of. Make sure the sheep have what they need. And make sure the sheep doesn't wander off into strange pathways to lead them to danger to die. And that's what God does with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside of you, He leads you where you won't go into a place to wander off into the pathway of the enemy to the vo to the wolves where they can pounce on you and destroy you. A love-hate relationship. A love-hate relationship. How many remember that movie, A Thin Line Between Love and Hate? Thin Line Between Love and Hate. And that was a very good movie, but it had a lot of meaning in it because there was this woman who cherished the Martin Lawrence as the man and wanted him for herself and nobody else to have him. So she wanted to control his life. And it was a thin line between love and hate. So anything he did, he had to make sure she okay. Otherwise, she's going to try to kill him. The enemy does the same thing. To examine an example of a father who betrayed, let's look at the relationship between King Saul and David. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm going to turn down my, my, uh, my Bible. First Samuel chapter 16. And in verse, and, and then chapter 31. It goes from 16 to 31 chapters. All, all those chapters together talk, talking about the story of uh, King Saul. So, and David, their they're, uh, they're rival. You know, their dissension between each other. And every time, let's see, 16, 16. says, so let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever a tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music, and you will be well again soon. All right, says Saul, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. And one of the servants said to Saul, 
One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He's also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. So when you get a chance, read 1 Samuel chapter 16 all the way to the 31st chapter, the end of the book. And you'll find out this love-hate relationship, the, the story entirely about King Saul and David rival. So it goes on. So their lives touched even before they met as Saul, the prophet of God. I mean, Samuel, the prophet of God, anointed David to be the next king of Israel. David must have been overwhelmed with excitement, thinking this is the same man who anointed Saul. And I am really going to be king. Back at the palace, Saul was being tormented by an evil spirit because he had disobeyed God. And we read the story of 1 of Samuel. The whole, you read the whole 1 Samuel, actually. You'll find out how Saul rejected, was rejected by God because of disobedience. It says his, his only relief came as someone played the harp. Saul's servant began to look for a young man who could sit in his presence and minister to him. One of King's servants, one of the, one of the king's servants suggested David, the son of Jesse. King Saul sent for David and asked him to come to the palace and minister to him. David must have thought God is already bringing this to pass, his promise, through the prophet. Surely I'll win the favor of the king. This must be an entry-level position. You know, and that's, that's something to think about. Because when David was summoned by King Saul to come and play music for him to calm his spirit, surely David could have thought to himself, oh, this is about to take place. Well, God had promised me I'm going to be the next king. Now I'm about to be mentored into the position of kingship. But instead, it turned the opposite. King Saul ended up, ended up growing hatred in his heart towards David. Time passed, and David's father asked him to bring refreshment to his older brothers who were in, in, at war in Philistine. Upon arriving to the battle lines, David saw the Philistine champion Goliath mocking the army of God and learned that they had gone on for 40 days. He found out that king, the king had offered his daughter hand in marriage to the man who, could, who defeated this giant. David went before the king and requested permission to fight. Permission to fight. He killed Goliath and won Saul's daughter. By then he had won Saul's favor and was brought into the palace to live with the king. Jonathan, Saul's oldest son, made a covenant of an everlasting friendship with David in everything Saul gave to David to do. The hand of God was on him and it, and it prospered. And that is so awesome because when God's hand is upon your life, everything you do will prosper. That is so amazing. Everything you do, when God has his hand on it, it's going to cause favor upon your life. It's going to bring you to an increase and in blessings all the days of your life, not just for you, but for your children and your children's children. That's how God operates. So when I bless you, I'm blessing your entire family, your whole lineage, your generation. The king requested that he eat at, 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 the, at the table with his own sons. David was thrilled. He was living in the palace, eating, the king's eating at the king's table, married to the king's daughter, friends with Jonathan, and successful in all his campaign. He was even the winning favor of the people. He could see the prophecy unfolding before his eyes. And that's what God would do. Not only would God give you favor with the king, but he give you favor with the people who are under the king, who are subjected to the king. So the same people will show you favor. Saul favored David over all his other servants. He became the father to him. David was sure... David was sure Saul would mentor and train him one day with great honor to put him on the throne. But David was rejoicing in God's faithfulness and goodness. He was rejoicing in God's favor and goodness. But in one day, everything changed. As Saul and David returned from battle, side by side, the women from all the cities of Israel came out dancing and singing. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. This inf infuriated Saul. That means made him very angry. From that day forward, he despised David. 
Wow. He despised David because the people began to praise David for the victory over Goliath instead of Saul. Saul was the king, of course. He had his army backing him up, but they all were cowards. Only one person selected by God to stand up against the Philistines was David with the boldness of the Lord and the strength of the Lord and the favor of God upon his life. He was not going to allow the enemy to torment God's people and defeat them. So David has such great faith in God to believe that I'm going to destroy you Philistines. Goliath, I'm going to cut your head off with your own sword. And guess what? He did just what he said. He defeated the Philistines, cut Goliath's head off with his own sword. And then the people began to shout and praise David for killing the Philistine leader. Twice as David played the harp for, Saul, for him, Saul tried to kill him. Twice as David played the harp for him, Saul tried to kill him. The Bible says that Saul hated David because he knew God was, was with David, but not with him. Oh, my God. My God, my God, do you see it here? Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture here? How, how Saul became so infuriated, angry with, with David. He wanted to kill David. So each time David played the heart, he wanted to kill him. Do you see the story here that the Bible says that Saul hated David because he knew God was with him? How many times have you been in position where it seemed like people hated you because of the anointing on your life? You preached a good word. You spoke a prophetic word. You sang an anointed song. And yet people hated you because you did what God told you to do and they were jealous of you. If you look at the story... <coughs> Saul became jealous of David. The reason why he wanted to kill him. And that's the same thing that's still going on in the church today. People are jealous of the pastor because he prospered. People are jealous of the pastor because he got fancy cars and a fine house. Beautiful children, beautiful wife. People are jealous of the pastor because they feel like that should be them in that position. But yet, you didn't do the work that God told you to do to be in that position. You didn't labor to be in that position. You didn't fast and pray to be in that position. You did not study the word of God to be in that position. So when God set you down, now you're mad at everybody else because you didn't do what God told you to do. We talked about this in previous lessons. I'll blame everybody else for the failure in my life. It's your fault. I'm not where I need to be in ministry. It's your fault. I don't have my own church right now. It's your fault. I'm not wealthy like I want to be. Because you had the means to help me and you didn't help me. So I have a jealous spirit in me, malice heart, enraging me now. I'm against anybody else who follow you. <coughs> So I begin to gossip, going to hit everybody, talk about folk, put people down, slander the pastor behind his back, backstabbing, tail bearer, all because I allow myself to be rejected by God. My God, my God, my God. Mm. David was forced to run for his life with nowhere else to go. He ran to the wilderness. He was forced out of the king, out of the king palace. He was forced out to run for his life because he had no else to turn, no one who to rely on. But Jonathan still loved him. Saul, oldest son, still loved David. And he never turned his back on him. What is, ha what is happening? David wondered. The promise was unfolding and now it is shattered. How many times you had a vision and a dream from God and all of a sudden you did everything God told you to do and it seemed like 
You're on your way up to the place God has for you to be in the plateau of ministry or on a job, the promotion that you believe you're going to get on this job. So everything you've done, you did the requirements, you, you labored, you stood in there through the test of time, the storm of the life, and all of a sudden, like the wool been pulled from under your eyes, the rug been pulled from under you, and you done failed. Everything is falling apart in your life. It's shattered. It's broken. And now you're in a place where you say, God, I thought this was you, but now everything is a shamble. My life is falling apart. My business not not accelerating. It's declining. The people I had supporting my business are no longer supporting me. God, what is it? I remember when I had my church back in 2005. I started a church from ground up. And I went through the very same thing. I felt rejected because I knew God told me to start this church. I did everything God told me to do, and it came to pass. The church was opened up. I rented a place in another building with another church. I had a congregation for a whole year. The church was doing good. But by the end of that first year, all the people started drifting away. And I said, God, what's going on? It dwindled down to two people, me and my wife at the time. And I began to cry out to God. I said, God, what's going on? Why is this happening to me? I don't know, Lord, what, what to do. Why are things falling apart? And the Lord began to show me my heart. He said, you are doing the right things, but your heart went all the way in it. So I had to let it shut down because I did not want you to be a hypocrite. I did not want you to be deceiving my people in any way to make yourself look good. Talking about rejection, I felt the worst rejection ever in my heart. But yet, it drove me to the place of repentance. Where I fell on my face before God in my house. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. If I had any form of pride in my heart, what well, I thought this was me, I'll bring this church and not you. And the church declined, and the falling apart, the severed, everything. But I learned from that, that in the future, when God begins to open that door again for me to establish my own ministry, I know exactly the posture, the heart posture. LaShonda talk about it all the time with me. The heart posture. Where is your heart? Where is the posture of your heart? Is it in humility or is it in pride? Is it in self-exaltation? Self-exaltation? Or are you laying before God? Saying, God, here I am. I surrender. So David was in a position where everything was shattering. He didn't know what to do. The man who was, it was who is my mentor is trying to kill me. What can I do? Saul is God's anointed servant. With him against me, what chance do I have? The king, he's the king. God's man over God's nation. Why is God allowing this to happen? And we all ask that question at one point in our lives. When your finances start depreciating, you lost your job, your health start going down, anything can go wrong, is going wrong in your life. And you ask God, God been trying to get a car, been trying to save for a car, but every time I save my money, something come up, I got to use it for this or use it for that. God, why does this keep happening? Saul chased David from the wilderness to wilderness and cave to cave, accompanied by 3,000 of Israel's finest warriors. Saul chased David from wilderness to wilderness and cave to cave accompanied by 3,000 of Israel's finest warriors. That's how bad he wanted to kill him. He had to have that many people for one man. Which reminds me in John chapter 19 when Jesus was being arrested they came with about 2,000 soldiers to arrest Jesus. And when Judas, he said, he said to the to the commander of the army, 
He says, the one who I kiss is the one you arrest. And it says in the scripture, when he came to Jesus, he kissed Jesus and all the soldiers fell to the ground. That's how powerful Jesus was. So Jesus could have very well, just like Saul brought these 3,000 soldiers, God could have very well intervened and knocked them all off their feet. The same way he did with Jesus. But yet Jesus still didn't resist the arrest. He surrendered to the arrest. He gave in to the arrest. He allowed them to take him willfully with no resistance. David, running from Saul, they had one purpose, to destroy David. These are the very ones that witness David fighting Goliath. These are the very ones that witness David defeating the Philistines. And yet, he sought to kill his life. At this point, the promise was just a shadow. How many times you felt like that? The plan that God gave you, the vision God gave you, the promise God told you, the prophetic words that have been spoken through the years of your life, seemed like just a shadow, a passing shadow. Seemed like it never happened. I'm, I'm today benefiting from prophetic words that were spoken back in 96. Words that were spoken over me about being in leadership, being in charge, prospering, traveling. The very things that were spoken over my life over 20 years ago, in the last 10 years, been coming to manifestation. Because I believe the prophetic word. The Lord says in his word, believe the Lord God and his prophet and you shall prosper. And the more you believe, it says, receive a prophet in the name of a prosper. And it says, receive a prophet in the name of a prophet. You shall receive a prophet's reward. So I'm benefiting from the prophetic word of a prophet. And I believe that word over 20 years ago that it will surely come to pass in my life. I did not doubt God. I did not stop believing that God would make it happen. But I stood in faith even to this very day. And say, God, I thank you for every prophetic word spoken on my life that it will surely come to pass. And that's starting to manifest every day of my life. David no longer lived at the palace nor ate at the king's table. He inhabited a damp cave and ate the scraps of the wilderness beast. He no longer rode on the king's side but was haunted by the men who once fought by his side. He no longer rode at the king's side, but now being haunted by the people he trusted, the ones he depended on. There was no warm beds or service to attend to him, no compliments in the royal courts. His bride was given to another, he knew the loneliness of a man without a country. Isn't that something? Talking about low. That's the lowest you can go. To where everything you once had has now been stripped away from you, even your wife, that the king gave you, gave to somebody else. And because of this rejection, David still, check this out, he still trusted God. He still believed God. He never doubted God. Even though he felt the rejection, he felt the pain, but he always reminded us that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down a green pasture. He, he, he relieves me by the still water. He restores my soul. Everything that God promises to do, David reminds himself of the word of the Lord that in spite of this I'm going through right now, there's a better day coming. I love that song, Better Days, by Landria, Landria, because better days are coming for you and are coming for me, even when it doesn't look like it. It don't feel like it all the time. Sometimes you wake up in the mornings, you don't feel like getting up, you feel depressed, you feel miserable, you feel like, what's the use of getting up? It's the same old cycle of life. 
Things aren't going to be any better. You go to the same old boring job, and everything you do is just a cycle. But yet there's no joy, there's no peace, there's no satisfaction, and you find yourself living in the mindset state of rejection and malice, bitterness, loneliness, abandonment, because you allow yourself to keep focusing on all the negative things in your life instead of what God has done for you. God kept you every day. He keeps providing for you. You got a job to go to. You got a car you can drive. You got money to put gas in your car when you need to. You can travel anywhere you want to go. You can buy anything you want to buy online in the stores. But yet you forget about the benefits. Because it says he daily loads us with benefits. And if God daily loads us with benefits, everything we need. He says, I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God who provides peace, wellness, healing, deliverance, victory from himself. So everything you need is found in the Lord God Jehovah. So I want to encourage you. Now we're going to stop right here. We'll pick it up next week. The rest of this chapter, we'll pick it up next week. But I pray that this helps somebody. Take, take a moment. When you're alone tonight, take a moment just to sit down and think. Think about your life. Do you have any rejection in your heart? Think about if you got any malice towards anybody, unforgiveness towards anybody, any hatred towards anybody. And allow the Holy Spirit to bring it to the forefront of your mind that you can repent of that thing. Even if you have to go to that person and ask them to forgive you, for holding on to those things in your heart. They might even be dead and gone. Speaking in the atmosphere, I forgive myself for holding on resentment towards my dead mother, my dead father. And that's God you come into my heart and forgive me for not, not allowing you to heal me. And then from that moment, begin to embrace the love of God as your father. And allow God to fill your heart with such a compassion, a gentle heart, an applicable heart, we can pour into your heart everything that's in him into you of his character and of his nature. Besides, you got his DNA in you already. When you're born again, you got his DNA. And God will begin to turn everything around in your life for your benefit. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for this word. I thank you, God, that it would penetrate our hearts tonight, oh God. Whatever's in our heart, there's a form of malice, hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness. Take it out, God. Purge it, cleanse us, saturate us, make us clean. And then, Lord God, make us better. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. It's one simple prayer. If you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And not only that, the Bible says, That if thou shalt confess in thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession made with the heart man believes unto righteousness. So if you just pray this simple prayer with me, you can be born again. You might even be born again, and you are one of those individuals that I was talking about tonight, and you need to be, be restored back in the presence of God. I want you to pray this prayer with me. God says he's married to the backslider. He will restore you. He will heal your backsliding ways. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord God, to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly, Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my heart. Make me clean. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit and power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner has turned their life around for the Lord. But I want you to stay encouraged. Share this video with somebody else. That will help change their life. You know anybody that you know on Facebook. 
that's experiencing rejection or went through rejection or even by even feel rejected today, send them this video. I'm going to put it on YouTube tonight as well as I always do each week. And you'll be able to also send them a YouTube version. If they don't have Facebook, you can send them the YouTube version. Because everybody got YouTube nowadays on their television or even on their phones. So you can have YouTube and you watch any video you want on YouTube. So I'm going to sit, put this video on YouTube. And I pray that it be enrichment to your life and somebody else's life. Because God loves us. He wants us to do better. To know better and do better. So when I know what I, what's wrong in my life, I can practice doing better. Because God is exposing us tonight. Because he doesn't want anything to hinder us from walking in his truth. Psalm 34, verse 17 through 20. Psalm 34, verse 17 through 20. It said, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such be of a contrite spirit. That's a humble spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. So I want you to be encouraged tonight and know that the Lord, he hears you when you cry with a sincere heart, a contrite heart, a broken heart, a humble heart. He hears you and he will deliver you and lead you in victory. So I encourage you tonight, stay in the word. Walk by faith and not by sight. Today is a, a great day to make it a great day on purpose for purpose. So walk in your purpose. And not only that, encourage somebody else. Share a kind word with somebody. Put a smile on somebody else's face. You might be concerned about issues in your life, but don't allow it to consume you. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead God and direct you. For the word of God says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it's a guarantee that God will go before you as the light of your pathway to lead you in victory. You all have a great night. Anyone have any questions or comments before we go? I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Because I tell you, this is an enriching lesson because rejection is a dangerous place to be when you don't know how to be healed from it. So I pray that you stay out and see my pastor on the night. God bless you, Pastor Cornell. I pray that you allow this message to really enrich your soul to want to do better and to change for the goodness of God and for the glory of God. And I tell you, when you do that, God will begin to release every blessing, every promise, the favor that you've been praying for on your life. It will come to pass on in your life because you're trusting God in his word. And the more you trust him, God don't mind blessing you. We're blessed every day of our life. We've got breath in our bodies. Our heart's still beating. So we're blessed. We're highly favored of God because God allows you to be alive every day. But stay encouraged. Stay encouraged. Until next week, the Lord says the same. We will resume again at the 6 o'clock hour on Tuesday evening. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this lesson tonight, oh God. I pray, oh God, that it help bring changes in all of our lives and those that have ears to hear we hear what the Spirit says to the church. That you, Lord God, would make us better, have us give us the desire to want to do better and be better in our daily walk with you, O God. And we thank you, O God, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights us in his way. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shalom, everybody. Have a good night. And the Lord says the same. We'll be back again next week.